1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. I'll be reading from the New International Version. To this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins. In his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I had planned to talk about something else this week, so Dee, what I talk to you about, I'll pick up on that next week. Uh, um, but when Dr. Billy Graham passed away on Wednesday, my heart immediately just felt tugged to talk about his legacy, to talk about what Dr. Graham spent his life doing, which was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I recall from my very youngest days the impact that uh, the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham had in my life, because it was at his preaching that my grandparents came to know the Lord. It was probably around the age of eight or nine where listening to him helped my mother make a decision to follow the Lord. And it was probably around the age of about seven where recently listening to Billy Graham and some others who were speaking, I one evening privately with my mother at home um, asked if we could pray a prayer where I would ask Jesus Christ into my heart and ask him to be my Lord and Savior. And I'm sure that for many in this room that uh, Dr. Graham had a great impact uh, on your lives or on your lives of those who are around you. My grandparents, of particular note, always wanted to make sure that um, I listened to Dr. Graham and when I was growing up. <laughs> Uh, we didn't get TV Guide, which was something you had to get, you know, back in those days for those that were younger, to know what would be on the three channels that you had. Um, but my grandparents did, and so they would parouse that and call us and let us know in something particular of note. Like, on Saturday at 7 o'clock, Billy Graham's going to be on, so put that on your calendar. And, and so we would, and we would um, listen uh, to Dr. Graham. It was probably just a very short time after I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior in the privacy of my own home uh, when I was influenced again by the work of Billy Graham. Uh, there was an evangelist who came to the Newburgh Church of God by the name of David Barr. Uh, he was with the Billy Graham Association. And um, he gave an altar call um, this particular day at the revival service. And I just kept hearing the words of Jesus, not to be ashamed of him before men. And so I walked forward when he gave the altar call, was just as I am, played, and was with many others who were crying. And I remember patting him on the back and saying, it's okay, you know, Jesus has forgiven you and with you. And the feeling of relief um, that I felt, and felt the difference and the change that God allowed to come into my life and the peace of his presence. This week, whenever I heard that Dr. Graham had passed away at the age of 99, I reflected on those moments and many others where his work and his dedication to that work had been an encouragement and inspiration to myself as well as, I'm sure, countless others. And so I was very moved to bring forth a message that would be honoring the tradition of Dr. Graham. And so uh, his own words echoed so much in my mind, using some of his words, some of his perhaps outlines might be a little familiar with you. I confess that I borrowed largely from some of his own ideas in our message today. <coughs> 
This message, I remember when I was younger, hearing Dr. Graham give one particular quote that I always remembered, and maybe some of you might have even uh, heard it this week, when he said that um, someday you will read and hear that Billy Graham is dead, but don't believe a word of it. I will be more alive than I have ever been. I simply changed my address. And that, in a small nutshell, is in fact the very reason for hope that any human being has. That we come to that realization and point that all of us who know the Lord do not truly die and pass away from existence, but only leave this world and enter into the presence of Jesus. This week, you probably, if you are on uh, social media and Twitter and Facebook and, or emails, many people uh, emailing around different quotes and ideas about Dr. Graham and the things that he had meant and paying tribute uh, to him, probably uh, heard a lot about the message that he gave. And yet, they know that there are so many who still live in this world who know very little about the thing that Dr. Graham almost exclusively talked about, which was about coming to know Jesus Christ by the power of his resurrection and by his work on the cross. You see, we live in a society that for many people, they don't really know why people care about the cross. For many, the cross is just a symbol in a world of symbols. It's just a means of decoration. It's a, a tattoo you put on your arm. It's a necklace that you put around your neck. It's a painting on a wall. But they don't know why is it significant. Because the cross is the most important thing that has ever happened. That Jesus Christ died to forgive our sins, the sins of the world. It was just last week that I, I was about to enter into a store. And as I was doing so, there was a small, I think, Perhaps an elderly lady was standing outside the door on a particular cold day. And as I was going to enter the store, you know, with my agenda about purchasing something in mind, uh, she went to hand me a track. And my initial response was, oh, no, it's okay. You can keep it. Um, I already know. I, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And she looked back at me and she said, but surely you know someone that doesn't. Surely you know someone that doesn't. And I thought in that moment um, how foolish my initial response had been, only thinking about myself and only applying the thing that she wished to share with me about God's truth and about his message of salvation because surely I do know people and surely there were people who would be all around me in the next few hours who did not know Jesus Christ. And so I took that track and I kept it with me, and I, I haven't handed it out yet, but I'm looking for an opportunity to do so. But it did make me keenly aware as I entered the store and um, no longer hurried as much with my agenda to get the thing that I had wanted to purchase, but instead focused on thinking about all those who were walking around the store and thinking how many of them did not know about Jesus, nor truly understand his mission, nor did they understand the purpose of the cross. Because the cross is the greatest act of love that has ever been done in the history of all time. In our passage today, in the 24th verse, Peter writes to us, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness, that by his wounds you have been healed. I remember I was right out of college and my boss, um, at the time, my first boss out of college, uh, said to me around Easter time, man, why do these stupid, crazy Christians call it Good Friday? I mean, Jesus died, and they call it good. So dumb. And I think that idea encapsulates what so many people think about the cross, about his life. Why do you call something good? Jesus died on that thing. How can that be good? They failed to understand it 
that to the world, the cross is a mystery. Why would you call something where supposedly someone you worship died upon it? Because the cross was the act that God gave to forgive us of our sins. Because we have all done things that have separated us from God, but that God allowed the cross to be a bridge for us to walk across from where we've separated ourselves from him to where we again may know him and have a relationship with him. That the cross allows us to see the depth of our sin. Because sometimes we forget almost how deeply our sins are an offense to God. How it grieves him. How it separates us. And that is why Good Friday is good. That is why the cross is good. Because Jesus Christ endured death, pain, and suffering that we may yet live to see the full extent of his love. You see, when Jesus hung on the cross, he carried the weight of all the sins of the world. From the dawn of time until all time will cease. He carried with him the hate and the prejudice and the pride and the lust and the jealousy and the murder. He carried with my sins and your sins. And he bore them on himself. Sometimes people ask, what is sin? Sin is anything outside of God's perfect will. It is an abomination to the righteousness of God. It is a lack of perfection from being what God's perfect will would be. God is righteous and God is holy, and by contrast, we are not. We have done things outside of his will that all of us, every human being, has done those things that are outside of God's will, and that in his perfection, God cannot even look upon and contemplate sin. You see, sometimes we like to think, well, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm better than most. If we were to grab a diamond, probably a lot of you have diamond rings on, and you look at it, and you can see how beautiful it is, how it sparkles, how it shines, and how it gives this outward appearance of great beauty. But if you took it to a great expert who was able to examine it under a microscope and do all the tests, they could, they could find every possible defect in that diamond. You see, you cannot always see and perceive things with the naked eye, and yet it is God who can perceive all things, who can look beyond the surface to see the smallest of the facts. And the reality is that we are all diamonds that have a defect. And yet, like diamonds, we are of great value to God. He cares about us and loves us, but we cannot be content in who we are, apart from the very grace and nature of God. You see, so many people who live in our nation have almost this false idea that because we are born in this nation, because we are Americans, that God simply loves us more than other people. And God loves this nation, and he loves the freedom it has, and he loves the rich and beautiful tradition that this nation has of following God and the importance of God's will. But God does not love us more because of the nation we were born in. Then he loves people in China or Japan or Vietnam or Liberia or Haiti or any nation around the world. He loves them just as much. We have this idea sometimes that God is like a Santa Claus. He's just sitting up there with a harp, that he's this old, senile old man who's just looking to give out gifts and blessings and gives you a wink and a shove when you do something outside of his will. But that's not the image of God that the Bible talks about. God is a God of justice and a God that will eventually lead to judgment. A God of righteousness and holiness. And if we think that we can lie and cheat and steal and God just turns a blind eye and gives us a wink and a nudge at it, we're wrong. That's not God's nature. I'm a sinner. And you are a sinner. And Jesus said that whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. That that sin just sort of enslaves us. 
We cannot break free from the thing that the sin wants us to do. To do, excuse me. But that God is a God of love, and He doesn't desire that we remain a slave to sin. Instead, the Bible tells us that He is a love, so He did something about this slavery. John 3.16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God developed a plan, a rescue plan, to save us. Because God knew that he created the first human beings and that they had fellowship with God, that they walked with him, that they knew him and his will, and he communicated with them, that they walked with him in the cool of the day, that they were, in fact, companions with God. But then one day something happened. <clears throat> because when God made us, he gave us the capacity of choice and free will. He gave us the choice, as he gave to those first humans, the ability to build their lives on their own apart from God, or to choose to follow what God's will perfectly was. And they made a decision that, if given enough time, we all would have made. To say, I'm going to try to do things in my own way and in my own time. That they would build a life outside of God's will. And in doing so, they broke the covenant, the promise that they had made with God, that they had broke that relationship, that they had sinned against God. And so today, we have problems. We sin. We have struggles, strife. We have things in our heart that we know are wrong, things that we feel like, I want to get rid of this, but I can't on my own. And we have to reach out to the one who has that ability to control those things. You see, but in that moment where sin is in it, where strife, where all these bad things have happened to us, and with us. God looked down and in his love and his mercy, he said, I gotta do something about this. He was moved to show us the extent of his love, to give us a plan to rescue us. And that's what Jesus did for us. The God who set all things in motion, who created all things that would ever be, who lit up the stars in the sky a distance of billions and billions of miles cares so much about each and every one of us sitting here today that he said, I'm going to leave the safety of heaven and I'm going to live it myself and become a human being. And that in doing so, I will take the sins of this world upon myself, live a perfect life, die on the cross, be resurrected again, overcome death so that every person who accepts me can have the ability to have eternal life. He died that we may live. And I think almost all of us, if not universally, know that this is true. Deep down inside our hearts, that God has planted that truth there. That no matter what image we try to project to the world, we know that we can't control the world. We can't do whatever we want. We can't make things right. But God can. And he's just asking us to come alongside him. To, to think about, you know, that, that bad habit, that sin, that compulsion that you have, that you think, I just can't stop this. That I'm a slave to it, that thing that you do that later you hate about yourself and you cry out for freedom from it, God can deliver you from those things. Because Jesus said to know the truth because the truth will make you free. And then he shared with those who are around him that he is the truth. But that's what you need. Jesus Christ, that sin affects our conscience, that God instilled upon us a conscience which comes um, from the words with knowledge. That there should be a little light that goes off when we do things apart from his will. And often there is, and we feel that quench, but sometimes people have so ignored their conscience, so dulled it, so consistently ignored the things that are right and wrong that they almost don't even feel that light anymore. 
They're not shocked or offended by their own sins or the sins of others around them. Regardless of the fact of how much our conscience personally shows us our own sin or does not, sin is still sin, and there's still a penalty for sin. And the Bible tells us that the penalty for sin, that the wages of sin, is death. That the moment that we have sinned, the moment that we have done something outside of God's will, that our sentence is death. Eternal death. And the cross of Jesus Christ shows us that we are sinners. But the cross also shows us that we don't have to remain in that sin. That when that we accept the acts of Jesus Christ, that when God looks at us, he no longer counts those sins against us, that he's willing to forgive us, that he's willing to remove those sins as far as the east is from the west that I'm willing to forgive you, that God is willing to give us a pardon, a reprieve, and his mercy and grace, giving us something more than we ever could deserve, forgiveness. And that's what the pages of the Bible tell us. Romans 5 tells us that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were yet in the death of our sins, with no ability to do anything for God. That's when God showed us the full extent of our love, that we were partners in this, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that we have the capacity to be transformed. As the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, to be a new creation, that the old has gone, but the new has come. You see, our response to the cross as Billy Graham talked about so many times, is the most important decision that a human being can ever make. What is our answer? Do we live a life that seeks God in every single aspect of life? Or do we want to do things that I want to do? Am I the one that's in control? And the more that we try to hang on to our control, the more likely we are to do things outside of God's will. When we can submit to follow God fully and completely, when we can give all things over to Him, He's able to use us fully. You see, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is always in the business of reconciling the world unto Him, reconciling us unto Him, taking the parts of ourselves that are broken and fragmented and hurt and bringing us to Himself. But He's offering us a hope and a better future, not only on this earth, but with him eternal and for all time. Dr. Graham often talked about three main points that we need to follow, that we need to understand and to live out if we really want to accept and follow Jesus Christ. The first of those is that we need to repent of our sins, to realize, yeah, I've offended God. I have done things wrong. I have lived outside of God's perfect will. That I owe a debt that I can never repay. And when we stand before God, we fully acknowledge the depth of that sin. And that we are willing to turn from that sin. To no longer be a slave and in bondage to that sin. And if you're sitting there and you're thinking about some particular action or some particular thing that you have always struggled with, we can't overcome some things on our own. But God has the amazing capacity to remove those things from our lives. If we place our trust in Him, sometimes they're instantaneous, sometimes they're a process. But God is with us. And He will take those things that are even hardships and He will use them for His glory. Because He desires that we do not sin against Him, but to live for Him. Secondly, we must receive Christ by faith. And faith is more than an intellectual agreement. The Bible says even the devil believes in God, and he shudders at that information. But we also know that it is more than just an emotional response. Emotions come and go, and sometimes in the height of emotion, people decide to do certain things, but later when their emotions change, they do not. Faith 
encompasses emotions, it encompasses intellect, but it mostly encompasses trust. It is the ability to place my trust that I should no longer be the primary person who is in control of the decisions and the attributes and the things that are reflective of my life, and instead I place them under the authority of Jesus Christ by my prayer life and by the direction of his holy word that he knows more than me and my life should be directed in such capacity to place our faith in him. And thirdly, Dr. Graham would talk about to obey Christ. That you must be willing to obey the things that he said. Because if you're not going to actually do it, it doesn't really change anything. And that, for our own lives, often means self-denial. Because it means that I'm not the one in control, but Jesus is the one who is in control. That in many ways it is almost like burning the bridge once we've crossed over it. Because there's no going back. It's a life directed to following where God wants us to lead us. And so it means that when we go out of here today, the decisions, what we do with our time, what we do with our lives, what we do with our money, what we do with our mind, what we do with our intellect, what we do with our anything about us, is in line with what God would want us to do, no matter what that cost is. And if we're willing to do that, and that is so pleasing to God. But as Dr. Graham said, that if we're not willing to do that, it might be better not to come to Christ. If we can't decide that we're actually going to obey the things that he leads us to do, then we're not really his disciple. There's no such thing as a halfway disciple. A person either follows Jesus or they don't. And so... As Dr. Graham said, we all need to repent of our sins, to place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, and to obey what he has told us to do. And if you have never done that, there is nothing more important for you to do. And there is nothing that is more important to me than to make sure that everyone who hears a message and the opportunity to know Christ has an opportunity to know him. You don't need to talk to anyone else. You just need to talk to God to confess your sins, repent, place your faith, and then to live a life in obedience to him. But many of us need instruction along the way. So if you need to talk to someone that you trust who knows Christ, please do so. I am always available, and I will never hesitate to spend my time instructing people who want to know about how to follow Jesus Christ because there is nothing that is more important than this because everything else we do comes and goes. But following Christ and making that decision for him is a decision that can last for all eternity. You see, Dr. Graham, above everything else, taught that this world is not our home. We are but visitors vacation here almost, so to speak, with an opportunity to be missionaries to bring other people back to the true home, to where we were always created and meant to have, where Christ has already been preparing a house for us. And I'd like to close this morning with a quote from Reverend Graham, who once said, I've read the last pages of the Bible and it's all going to turn out all right. Because the cross has shown us the seriousness of our sin. But it has shown us the immeasurable love of God. That God showed us his love on the cross. That when Christ hung there, when he bled and he died, he was saying to this world, I love you. You see, being a Christian is more than an instantaneous conversion. It is really the daily process by whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. And I have never known anyone to accept Christ's redemptive work and later regret it. You see, the message that I preached hasn't changed. Circumstances changed. Problems changed. But deep inside humanity has not changed. The gospel hasn't changed. 
And I know this, my home is heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. And the moment that we take our last breath on this earth is the moment we take our first in heaven. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity we have to know you. God, we know that we need you. I reminded of one more quote from Dr. Graham. He said, I'm not going to heaven because I've preached to numbers of crowds, because I've read the Bible. I'm going to heaven for the same reason the thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves before you with the knowledge that heaven is a gift. We bow before you and ask that we all remember you today, and we ask that you remember us in your kingdom. Help us to repent of the things we know that we have done outside of your will, to turn to you, to trust you in times when life seems hard, to obey you in all times, to know the message of the cross and to live it out eternally. We pray this in the name of our only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.